to have his perspective. And so I'm just going to ask him to speak. David, welcome. Welcome to California, sort of. <laughs> yeah, disadvantage. I don't get to come to California. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to, uh, I've been advised, talk maybe for 20 minutes or so, and then questions and discussion. So I'll, I'll try to do that with a PowerPoint uh, that I can share here. Let me know if you're seeing this. Um, and, and this, if I don't get through this whole PowerPoint or you want to see it again and figure out what I said, I went too fast, you can go to worldbeyondwar.org slash Ukraine and there it is. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, well, there's, you know, most of humanity entirely blaming either one side or the other in this thing as instructed by their televisions. Uh, and others blaming both sides uh, and blaming both sides equally. Uh, and I think the whole, you know, all three of those uh, analyses are wrong. Uh, I think there are a lot of things in which both sides are uh, at fault and roughly equivalent. The US and Russia both have and use militaries. So uh, one of them only costs 8% what the other does, but still uh, they both are threatening to fight second, uh, and both claiming the other is going to start the war. Uh, of course, <laughs> you line up masses of armed troops uh, on opposite sides of a small region uh, with fighters already uh, exchanging shots uh, within that region, uh, and you scream that the other side is going to start it and pretend you started it, uh, and pretty soon people are shooting more, uh, and pretty soon the possibilities of avoiding war uh, look slim. Um, both love their nationalism and their militarism, both have enough nukes to destroy all life on earth many times over, uh, etc. This is, this is all very true, uh, but they're not equal here. This thing is nowhere near the United States. If Russia had tanks and missiles and military alliances and threats of war and claims the U.S. was about to start an invasion in Canada or the Bahamas or Mexico or Central America, the United States would be making the exact same demands that Russia has been making for months. Get your troops and your weapons and your military alliances away from our border. Perfectly reasonable demands ought to have simply been met flat out months ago. Uh, the US, uh, meanwhile, claims to be coming in to help Ukraine, the president of which has been <laughs> rather sarcastically, uh, this is a, you know, a, a resemblance uh, to Trump in one way. He's a, he was a former TV star, you know, sitcom star playing president now. But he's been saying, no, thank you. Go rescue somebody else. You're, you're causing trouble. Uh, and not equivalent in the general scope of things in that the U.S. is far and away the world's top supplier of weapons uh, and military alliances and military bases and launcher of wars. Uh, and could launch a massive global reverse arms race in a heartbeat, uh, could disarm half the world uh, by simply ceasing to arm it. Uh, so th these are not equivalent uh, in this sense. Um, remember these guys, we were just talking about the need to maybe not forget one of these guys. Both of these guys had lawyers in the White House literally redefine the word imminent to mean this is this is basically the legal definition for the united states not the rest of the world hell i don't know maybe someday this is what imminent means and it seems that the u.s government actually takes that seriously and uses the word in that sense now um trying to see okay uh so this is this is the bigger context right this is this is risking nuclear war. We all remember packing the streets in February of 2003 because some jackasses were lying about a country having nukes that didn't have nukes. Now, the country in play here has got half the nukes on Earth. Uh, and nobody's even mentioning it, you know, much less telling lies about it. And we're not in the streets. 
basically, most of us in any numbers. Uh, this is this is insanity. Nothing. There is no possible outcome that's that's not better than risking nuclear war. Uh, you you may have seen that uh, President Biden has proposed a bigger military spending bill than he proposed last time, which was bigger than any of Trump's, which were bigger than Obama's and so forth. This is the course of things. Uh, and you can't do this uh, without an enemy. The, the enemy, whatever flaws there may be in it itself, is desperately needed and deeply valued as an enemy. You can't do it with Middle Eastern terrorists anymore. You have to have Russia and or China. Uh, and uh, and there's always money for that. Uh, and there's always money to send more weapons uh, to Eastern Europe. But there's not money for anything we actually need. Um, this is the situation in, in Ukraine. This is one of these, you know, CNN election maps like they do in the U.S. with the red states and the blue states. Uh, and, you know, Crimea is at the bottom. The two regions uh, at the far right uh, are the ones uh, that are in play here uh, with both sides threatening to invade them if the other side does first. Uh, and, you know, you, you're, you'll be told that Russia already invaded eight years ago and has never left. Uh, which is only true on a tiny sort of uh, scale compared to what you know they're announcing daily Russia is about to do. Uh, you'll be told that Ukraine, you know, by definition, can't invade itself; it's part of Ukraine. But the 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 arrangement in the the Minsk II agreements, uh, for what they're worth, with neither side uh, complying with them. Uh, is for these regions to self-govern, uh, not to be an independent nation, not to be part of Russia, but to have a great deal of autonomy and self-governance, uh, which Ukraine doesn't uh, want them to. Um, and you know, if if the U.S. military rolled tanks in, in into California, uh, you couldn't say, "Well, this isn't really happening because it can't be by definition." You know, it would be happening. Um, this is this is the, the the longer you know historical context here. Uh, the Cold War supposedly ended. Germany reunited into one scary large Germany. And Russia said, okay, that's okay with us. Uh, but they were promised uh, by the US government that NATO would not expand eastward. Well, very shortly it began expanding eastward and you can see it's now within the old boundaries of the Soviet Union, closer to Russia, in fact, on the border of Russia as it never was during the, the supposed existence of the Cold War uh, and with missiles in Poland and Romania uh, aimed at Russia. Uh, this, is, this is the problem. Russia is scared of this and is making demands exactly identical to what the US made when there were Russian missiles in Cuba uh, and what the US would be making if there were Russian missiles anywhere near the United States. Uh, you know, the, the notion that what's at stake here is something called the rule-based order and that the United States has anything to do with leading it uh, and that the seizure of Crimea was the major threat to peace and harmony uh, of the past quarter century, uh, you know, is absolutely nuts. Um, yes, Russia should not have its military in Crimea. Yes, you should not have votes with militaries uh, present. Yes, Russia's military should be abolished, as should every military on Earth. Uh, but when you're talking about upper extreme estimates of casualties in this horrendous seizure of Crimea of a grand total of count them six, when the U.S. has been waging war after war after war with the corpses piled up in the millions, uh, and when the U.S. is the major holdout on basic human rights treaties uh, and the major opponent of the International Criminal Court, 
uh, and wages wars, you know, and threatens wars in violation of all of these treaties and agreements listed on this slide, uh, it, it's just too hypocritical to take seriously. The, the other thing that's missing from the story that we're always told uh, is the coup, <laughs> you know? Yes, there's been an election. Yes, the president is Jewish. My God, how many thousands of times do people have to tell me this? But governments always have elections following coups. It doesn't always change the fundamental state of the government. Uh, and this was, this is the, this is an extreme case of a US supported coup in two senses. In one sense, because it's immediately completely erased from consciousness. And in the second sense, because we have what people always dream of, we have actual audio recordings of US officials planning it and photographs of them coming uh, to the protest in, in the square and handing out pastries. Um, this was eight years ago, a coup that put in place a government and, and a military with Nazi elements, with anti-Russian and ethnic Russian elements, with an immediate ban on the Russian language, uh, with right-wing violence and, and mobs. Uh, and so you then had this so-called seizure of Crimea, uh, which by the way, included a vote. And, you know, it, it, Crimea is a very weird case that it was formerly part of Russia, then it was part of the, the USSR, but so was Ukraine and Russia and so forth. It's not technically a colony. It's not supposed to get to vote on where it becomes part of. Uh, but then, you know, neither is Quebec or Scotland, you, you know, and, and we don't have a panic attack. Uh, and the fact is that Ukraine could vote a thousand more times and it would never once vote to be part of Ukraine. Um, so, you know, if you're going to support small d democracy, uh, you have to take that at least somewhat seriously. Um, Major, major war rehearsals, war games, uh, biggest in 75 years, uh, closest to Russia in 75 years, leading up to the supposed Russian creation of this crisis. Uh, Buildup of weapons uh, across Europe, uh, the countries that are not blue on this map uh, have US bases. The countries that have a little nuclear bomb on them have nuclear weapons. Uh, five of them, arguably illegally, have US nuclear weapons uh, in this picture. Um, these, this, these are dates circled on an article uh, from last year about the buildup of weapons and forces and military drills uh, on, the, on the, the good side, the Ukrainian side of Donbass, not the Russian side. Uh, and so we should keep the chronology straight. This is what happened was not a massive Russian buildup of troops followed by a Ukrainian buildup of troops. Uh, if anything, it was the other way around. Um, as I said earlier, imagine walking a mile in their moccasins. Imagine uh, if it was Russian weapons and, uh, and forces on the US border, how reasonable the demands to get them the hell out of here would sound. Um, the propaganda, I mean, this is why I wrote a book called War is a Lie years ago to help people spot the lies. They're, they're recycled. I mean, this is the greenest thing, the, the biggest recycling operation the US government does. They use these same, same lies. Every government is reduced to a single person who's reduced to Hitler. But Russia is not conquering territory. <laughs> you know, conquest and occupation are virtually gone and have been for longer than I've been alive. Uh, you know, Hitler is dead. Um, 
you know, how can you tell when an advocate for war is lying? Their wallet is growing. The, the financial interests here are so clear. The weapons, the weapons companies, the CEOs are talking up their excitement, their glee over this possible war. Uh, it's, it's shameless. Um, so you have these debates in the corporate media, more weapons to stop the Russian aggression, more diplomacy and negotiation to stop the Russian aggression. The whole point of which is to make the agreed upon basis for the debate unquestionable. So that you just, it's unthinkable that what we're dealing with is anything other than Russian aggression. Um, the global hotspots, including Ukraine, all have one thing in common and it's based in Washington, DC. We ought to consider that fact. We ought to maybe take seriously all the Munich appeasement talk but wonder who it is that's being appeased, because I think it's the major media outlets, it's the major weapons dealers, it's the bought and paid for Congress members, it's the people in the State Department and the Pentagon pushing for more and more hostility and militarism. Why, why is nobody, even a US president, ever asked to stand up to them and stop appeasing them? Uh, this thing has gone on so long and they've needed a new version, a new story every day that they're saying the little quiet parts out loud. They're putting on the front page of the New York Times the interest of U.S. oil companies uh, in blocking Russian gas to Europe. Um, this was a useful issue of Peace Science Digest this month uh, with studies uh, on how threatened or actual harm can provoke an adversary rather than coerce them. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing this madness where you threaten war uh, supposedly to prevent war with the exact opposite effect. Um, try to get to questions here. These are some photos uh, of a peace demonstration in Kiev uh, at the U.S. Embassy uh, with a list of U.S. wars and a request for the U.S. to, to get out. Um, the president of Ukraine, again, has, has echoed these sentiments uh, to a certain extent. You know, he, he's, he's objected to the war is happening in two days uh, nonsense. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the, the pretense that this, that the, the buildup and the threats has had some positive effect and Russia is newly open to talks. Uh, we've had that headline, you know, quite a number of times in, the, in recent weeks, but we've never had Russia is closed to talks that, you know, never happened. And this is a pattern. It's a pattern we can talk about World War II, getting the war in Korea started and numerous other examples. You build up to war, you provoke, you have an arms race, you have threats and provocations from both sides, and then you pretend it was all the other guy's fault. Um, these, are, these are a number of useful websites. Again, this first one is where you can find uh, everything I'm showing you here and a lot more. Uh, there's also nowarinukraine.org, blackallianceforpeace.com has a Ukraine uh, website. Um, and Stop sharing. How many minutes did I go over? Oh, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so, so why am I paid by Putin and what do, do I need to answer for? <laughs> We're open to questions and I'm gonna have David sort of do that. If you can use the raised hand under the reactions, it's much easier because you go in line first and second, uh, the people who raise their hands first. So use the raised hand symbol under reactions if you have a question. Yes, Jim, go ahead, unmute, please. He can unmute, right? Yeah. Yeah. Quick question. Um, so the United Nations, I think it was like two years ago, um, I looked this up because it was the whole Ukrainian controversy with Biden. Their count was 14,000 Ukrainians have died from the Russian occupation. Um, I've also 
had con I've also had chat conversations with people that have been in Ukraine and they've confirmed that it's not free. Uh, the occupation is more than just simply Crimea. It's about 14% of their country. So like how some people would like to describe it, plus or minus, it's like Russia took over essentially, tech. it would be like Mexico taking over Texas. Um, and yeah, the, so that's kind of like my first question. My second question, um, I agree we shouldn't go in there initially in any way, shape or form. Um, and right now it looks like the EU is saying that they're not going to accept the pipeline. And that's in part because of the massive inve investments into electric vehicles that will never use oil. <laughs> so I don't understand those two points that if the EU is heavily investing into electric vehicles, that will never use oil. And they've already said that if Russia invades, they're gonna cut off that pipeline. And the reason why they're cutting it off is because they're on their way to no longer requiring. So those two points I don't understand, thank you. Well, I don't necessarily fully understand them myself, but I will try to help a little bit. It's a, it's a, rather ironic comparison in, in that most people in the United States don't know that Texas was part of Mexico or that Mexico was willing to sell it for a pile of dollars or that the United States preferred to take it violently because a war was better than, than buying it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think we have to be aware of this history because the rest of the world is. Uh, yes, Crimea and Donbass are not the same places. They were separate little blobs on that map I showed earlier. And the 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 number I cited, which wasn't three, but six, although they're pro both pretty darn close to each other, uh, was what I've seen uh, repeatedly as the highest estimate of casualties in Crimea in the greatest threat to the rule-based order of the past half century, the seizure of Crimea. Uh, yes, in Donbass, there has been violence, not just today with a kindergarten getting shelled, uh, but for years now. Uh, it's been violence uh, from two sides, as remarkably enough, wars always involve. Uh, and, and who was the first, and who invaded who in that? Who sent forces into whose country? With regard to the 14,000 dead. Those 14,000 dead are not a one-sided slaughter. They're two sides of an ongoing conflict, whether that number they is accurate They sent an or army not, into their country. Those people don't want those people there, so, so yeah, they're going to shoot back. There is, you, you, will, you will, I think, acknowledge a, a, a severe problem with the idea that Russia both has had its army in Donbass for eight years and is threatening to send its army into Donbass. Uh, <laughs> the, both of these things cannot be true. Um, what Russia, Russia had mercenaries and soldiers uh, and ammunition and assistance of all kinds uh, in this region uh, and has to some limited, very limited extent for eight years. Uh, this is a conflict between uh, those with great loyalty to their Russian ethnic heritage who don't necessarily want to be part of Russia, uh, but don't want to live uh, in a nation where they are second class citizens and their language is banned and so forth. Um, and uh, those opposed to them, uh, you know, and there's been this divide in Ukraine for many, many years, but it's been heightened uh, and intensified by the US and NATO on one side and Russia on the other. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, when, you have, when you have a coup facilitated by one side, put in power a government that is hostile to a big chunk of the country, and then you have people in the most extreme part of that other identity in the country say, we want to be separate. We want, some of them want to be part of Russia. Some of them just want more autonomy. Uh, 
and, and then you have this violence kicked off by both sides. Uh, you know, you have you have Russia claiming that they are going to protect uh, the people of this region for humanitarian purposes. And of course, they in the most misguided, backward, barbaric, criminal, destructive way possible with a military, right? And you have NATO and the United States and, and the Ukrainian government say, no, we are going to maintain a united Ukraine and fend off the Russian aggression. Uh, most of these people and most of these governments don't want a war. They don't want a war. And God knows the people in this region, most of whom have not yet been killed, don't want a war. But neither side wants to back down or stop being macho or stop profiting or stop. Oh, and, and this, this oil thing, yes, a heavy investment in electric vehicles does not mean you don't have gas powered vehicles and it does not mean you don't have a gas or coal powered uh, country in many other industries and sectors. Uh, and I have seen no indication that Europe doesn't want uh, this pipeline. Uh, of course, Ukraine wants it to keep going through Ukraine and to get, be getting paid for that. Uh, Europe wants it one way or another. Um, and, uh, you know, but the United States does not want it. <laughs> the United States wants to isolate Russia. And on top of that, icing on the cake, sell its own fossil fuels as a generous humanitarian favor to Europe at a slightly higher fee. Uh, so, I mean, and the madness of it all is that these fossil fuels, one way or another, are going to kill us all if the wars don't. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure I have not answered Jim's questions, but let's go to Helene. Helen, Helene. Okay. Hi, quick question. I, I've, you know, been watching CNN and all this sometimes, and they keep talking about the separatists in the Ukraine, the separatist forces. Do you know what they're referring to? And what is that about? Well, they're, uh, again, there are people uh, in the eastern parts of Ukraine and the southern part of Ukraine that are uh, that identify as Russian, have a Russian language, Russian relatives, etc. Uh, and some of them would like to be part of Russia, like Crimea has rejoined Russia. Some of them would like to be a separate country. Uh, some of them would just like more autonomy uh, and they act and there's actually an agreement in place though both sides are failing to comply with it in numerous ways uh, that says that they shall have uh, great autonomy in fact the phrase seems to be self-governance they're going to govern themselves rather than the the federal national government of ukraine Govern him. So you know, these this is what's referred to as as separatists. Uh, you know, it's when the people in Quebec were trying to vote to leave Canada, they would be called separatists. That's you know basically what it means. Um, Dale, thank you. Okay, um, two things. Um, my understanding of the um, the the new pipeline or the one that isn't going through Ukraine. Is it is is that it it is a natural gas pipeline? Is that true? It doesn't carry other petroleum product products, just natural gas. And then my my second question, which I'd like you to um, highlight a little bit more, is uh, what was the nature of the coup? It that you refer to when was it? Um, who was ousted? A democratically elected someone favored to the Russians, maybe, and then who would, who took over at, that we supported, and was that democratic? Uh, first question, I don't know. I think that's wrong, but I don't know. But Google knows. Um, uh, second question. Uh, Let's not use the word we in that way. I mean, let, let's not <laughs> claim that we uh, supported someone and we instituted a coup when we don't know anything about it and in fact are in the process of asking what the hell it was. Um, the U.S. government, the U.S. State Department, the U.S. AID, uh, the CIA, the U.S. military, 
uh, which are not we, uh, supported a coup in 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, this is, you know, following years of interference and pressure and misguided influence from both the US and NATO on one hand and Russia on the other in Ukraine. This is following years of elections and color revolutions, the orange revolution uh, of the election of presidents and governments that slightly favored NATO and the EU and presidents and governments that slightly favor Russia and, and so forth. Uh, and in 2014, you had in place uh, a president who slightly favored Russia. Uh, the country itself, you know, is deeply divided, as I showed in that colored graphic. Uh, almost everyone, maybe decreasingly so a little bit, but almost everyone wants to be Ukraine. They don't want to be part of Germany. They don't want to be part of Russia. They don't want to divide. Uh, they want to be Ukraine. Uh, but many of them are, are more loyal, more sympathetic to Russia and others to Europe. They've, they, they've had public votes and never wanted to join NATO. Uh, they've had governments that wanted to join NATO, but not the public of Ukraine. Uh, anyway, in 2014, you had, you know, and this is with the US government putting in billions of dollars funding and working with activist groups, encouraging agitation and protest. Uh, you actually had a, a, a phone call uh, recording made public of the U.S. State Department uh, top officials, including Victoria Nuland, who is back in that job again now with under Biden, uh, talking about who they wanted out, who they wanted in, uh, who should have some say with the new guy they wanted in and so forth. Uh, and, and then you have this protest that turns violent, uh, the 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 elected president, uh, you know, flees for his life, leaves the country. Uh, the new, the and you have these these horrible Nazi uh, gangs that are part of uh, of this coup, uh, and you have this new government put in with the guy handpicked by the U.S. State Department, uh, and and you have you know the government passing laws to ban Russian in the schools and everything will be Ukrainian. And, and you have these Nazi gangs running wild and, you know, engaging in lynchings and vandalism and, and horrible violence. Uh, and you have people who, you know, identify as, as Russian who now see this looming threat and you have this, you know, history of right-wing fanaticism and Nazism going back to, World War II in Ukraine, uh, you know, they're panicked. They they want out, and and of course Crimea uh, votes to leave, uh, and some of these other uh, areas in the east want to leave. Um, and uh, so you know, since then you've had an election where they 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 you know they are sick to death of all the politicians, just like over here in this country. So they elect a TV star, just like with Trump. They elect a guy whose only qualification for the presidency was that he had played this idiot who happened into becoming president on a TV show, uh, you know, and and they put him in place um, and you know, and, and he was supposed to be a reformer and he was supposed to not take sides with the Russians or NATO, you know, and it, it, it hasn't worked out very well. I Googled the new pipeline. It's a double pipeline, but it is natural gas only as far as I can tell. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Yeah, hi. Uh I want to thank you for all, all your work and in, 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 uh, speaking to us tonight. I'm sorry if I missed this. I had to do a couple things here, but did you speak about the, the Min Minsk uh, treaty or pact or whatever it is? My understanding is that the, the Donbass region, this may be part of the Minsk agreement or not, uh, to uh, have a certain autonomy and there also might have been an agreement that they would never join NATO. I'm not 
sure exactly. I read a little bit about it, but I don't recall at all. I wonder if you could speak about that. I did very briefly. And as I said, the language in the English version appears to be self-governance in the Minsk II agreement uh, for the Donbass region, for these two regions there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see news stories that all the Russian spin on it is that they should have self-governance, but that is actually the words uh, of the agreement. Um, and, and so it's hard to see how that's a Russian spin on things. Um, but they don't have self-governance. Uh, the, the national government in Kiev doesn't want them to. Um, and so, you know, the, the both sides uh, told the United Nations today, this morning, uh, that they supported continuing negotiations on the basis of that agreement. Uh, both sides don't appear to mean it. Um, but the Russian spokesman at the UN this morning said nothing other than we want to negotiate, we want to do diplomacy, we want to figure out a peaceful way out of this. Maybe he was lying, maybe he wasn't, that's all he had to say. Immediately after he left the chair, you had Secretary of State Blinken sit down and say, the Russians have threatened war again. The Russians have threatened war again. The Russians are going to probably fake a false flag incident to get a war started. This is dangerous. And then at the end of his remarks, I want diplomacy and negotiations and so forth. Uh, you know, and you could go back, rewind on, go watch it on C-SPAN and, and sit through the Russian guy again. He's boring as hell. But if you sit through it, nowhere do you find this threat. You know, and you can ask you can ask any reporter. I've been asking several of them. I've been having long debates on Twitter with them. Where is the threat? And, and either they'll say, either they'll point to the Russian threat to act second, which is exactly identical to the US threat. They're both threatening to act second and claiming the other guy's gonna act first. Or they'll claim threats aren't verbal. It's the troops sitting there. That's the threat. Don't you see them? You know, or they'll say, they don't have to threaten anything. They already invaded eight years ago. Well, then what is it that's being threatened? You know, they, you know so the, there's, there's just this widespread assumption uh, because it's repeated thousands of times that Russia is threatening war. But this business, and this is, I'm quoting the president of Ukraine here, this business of constantly claiming that the other guy is about to start a war, provokes and moves things toward war. No wonder people in Donbass are firing their weapons more. You know, I mean, look at the look at the cops in Canada talking about how action is imminent in Ottawa. Everybody's playing a role in the biggest story in the news. Uh, but it shouldn't be the biggest story in the news that somebody's threatening a war if nobody's threatening a war. Um, tell me when to stop. Marlene. Actually, my husband's going to ask you the question. Yeah, I have a question and a comment. Uh, uh, first, I'll give uh, the comment. I read an excellent piece uh, some days back. It was in the Jacobin magazine, and it was an interview with the Ukrainian sociologist, and I highly recommend people read that. Uh, but I guess my I guess my question is very simple. Shouldn't our demand be no to NATO? Obviously, no to war is good, but it's it's more ambiguous than no to NATO. Because, well, that's what I think the demand should be, no to NATO. And I'll let you comment, and I would be curious to know what others have to say to you on that. Well, I, I, I have unlimited demands. We could be here all night listing my demands. I think the most pressing one is don't kill us all this week. Uh, a slightly longer term one is abolish NATO. 
a, a bigger one than that is abolish all the militaries in the world. I, I mean, yes, these are all good things. I'm not going to say one is the demand and the others are are lousy. I mean, they're all good. If you if you go to worldbeyondwar.org slash no to NATO, you'll you'll see our case for abolishing NATO at a conference we held uh, a few years ago when NATO was meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, protest them. Um, if you see the interview that Jack Matlock did on Democracy Now!, I think today, maybe it was yesterday, I can't keep things straight, it just rolls on and on, but this was the one of the last U.S. ambassadors to the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, what he said uh, was that at the time, the promise was made not to expand NATO, and that was what he wanted, not to expand NATO, but he did want to keep NATO. And Amy Goodman, why did no, not Amy Goodman, but her co-host, why did you wanna, why did you wanna keep NATO? And he said, well, you know, the NATO was to keep Russia out and keep the US in and keep Germany down. We still wanted to keep the US in and keep Germany down. Right. So this was the purpose of keeping NATO around was to keep the US in control of Europe and, and in particular of Germany. Uh, but then NATO needed a reason to exist. It needed to expand. It needed to start fighting foreign wars around the world. You know, so I, I respectfully think Mr. Matlock was mistaken to want to keep NATO. <laughs> I don't, of course, I don't think it should have existed in the first place. Um, but yes, certainly at this point, after its wonderful favors to the world in Afghanistan and Libya and uh, and, and so forth, um, it, it it shouldn't exist. I mean. You can claim its marvelous success opposing the Warsaw Pact, which for 30 years has appeared not to even exist, but that's because it hasn't even existed, right? And so, you know, get rid of it. Um, Anna. Yeah, I had a NATO related question too, as to when we talk about, well, Russia is, is gearing up its troops and we're gearing up our troops, is NATO in, not exactly independently, but how is, is NATO manipulating the situation to its benefit? That's my question. And well, NATO is NATO is largely an arm of the US government, uh, a little less so thanks to Trump's supposed opposition to NATO, which amounted to demanding that all of the NATO members buy more weapons uh, and invest more heavily in NATO. I mean, with enemies like this, who needs friends? Uh, it, it's a bureaucracy that wants to grow and expand, uh, and it's building a case that either it's needed to protect Europe from Russia, or it's proving its value by deterring Russia. I mean, they're already claiming that if Russian, if Russia doesn't invade Donbass or Ukraine, as they say it, uh, this will prove that the that the deterrence worked. That all the weapons and the war games and the threats and the hostility and the provocations that created the whole problem actually were the solution to the problem. This is the case they're going to make if they don't start a war or kill us all. Is is that is that NATO prevented the Russian aggression? I mean, this is this is the other thing that's not equivalent here. The Russians talk about the U.S. diplomats uh, as if they're human beings meriting respect and you ought to have negotiations with them, just like the U.S. talked about the Russians back in the days of Reagan and Bush the older, right? Uh, the U.S., even the, you know, the Secretary of State, they talk about Russia as if it's one guy and he's a little cracked and he's kind of, you know, you, sort of this Asian, uh, obscure, inscrutable madman and you can't really tell what he wants to do, you know. Right. Although Russia laid out its perfectly reasonable demands in writing in December, right? And so uh, NATO gets out of this a reason for existing, uh, you know, and that's that's what it wants. But of course, NATO doesn't want Ukraine in NATO, you know, because it, oh. it's not this, this freedom, we're protecting Ukraine's freedom to choose what it does, including join NATO or not join NATO. It's not just up to Ukraine. If all the members of NATO allow Ukraine to join, they are committing, they are required to join in any war that Ukraine gets itself in, right? This is what NATO means. It's a, it's a war alliance 
that any war that any NATO member gets in, all the other NATO members have to pile on and join in that war. Right. So when you had England and France sending military ships to some teeny little islands last year over about fishing rights, if they'd actually started a war, every single member of NATO would have been legally required to attack both of them. Right. This is what it is. It's a war alliance. Um, but but NATO, but NATO eventually wants, you know, to, to take over the world. They're trying to add Colombia, you know, which is not very northern or or Atlantic. Uh, so, you know, NATO wants NATO wants sort of a long term progress to bringing Ukraine more deeply, steadily into NATO. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily want Ukraine in NATO now, which is exactly what Russia doesn't want. <laughs> and yet we can't sit down and agree. Um, uh, David. Okay, well, um, to your last point, um, uh, Russia doesn't want um, Ukraine and NATO, and NATO doesn't want Ukraine and NATO. And uh, um, Zelensky is, has uh, said that, uh, uh, you know, maybe you while know, well, asking Biden to stop all the strident rhetoric uh, all the time, and uh, maybe it might be to Ukraine's interest to uh, not, you know, go for NATO. Um, so what, are, are, there, are there really any substantive negotiations between Russia and uh, the United States? Or is it, um, you know, I, I would think, you know, they would start with, you know, some number of years that Ukraine wouldn't be um, uh, invited into NATO, even if they wanted it, or uh, yeah, that would just get down to the number of years. I don't think you can uh, um, make a determination in 2022 that would hold forever uh, that uh, they couldn't do or not do something like get into NATO. Uh, so what kinds of negotiations, uh, substantive ones about Russia's um, wishes have been uh, undertaken and what should be the parameters of a um, uh, of a good resolution between Russia and the United States and NATO. Well, it is one possible way to de-escalate this madness in the short term. Uh, would be either for NATO to say we don't want Ukraine at least for twenty years, or we don't want Ukraine ever, or for Ukraine to say we don't want to join NATO or we don't want to join NATO at least for X number of years. I mean, th these would be very helpful things. Uh, in terms of your, uh, of your question, what substantive discussions have been going on between the United States and Russia, uh, I certainly hope some, but they've been kept very secret if they are. What, what we know has been going on and what we've seen in written exchanges following meetings, uh, you know, has been Russia making very substantive demands, no NATO in Ukraine, no weapons and troops in Ukraine, uh, no, no weapons on our border in, in nearby nations, et cetera. Uh, and the US saying hell no to any of that and proposing other very minor off topic things uh, that Russia doesn't care that much one way or another about. Uh, and, and Russia has found this to be very disrespectful and uh, unproductive. And the US has said, well, you have your point of view and we have ours and we don't seem to be in agreement. Now, why isn't Ukraine saying Let's defuse this whole thing. We don't want to be part of NATO. We want peace throughout Europe. I don't know, but I know that Ukraine has tons and tons of money, billions and billions of dollars flowing in from the US government, billions and billions of dollars worth of weapons flowing in from the US government. Uh, the, the threat of what the US government does to nations it doesn't like 
the sanctions that the US government is imposing on nations that have stepped out of line. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, if you want to see the sort of way the U.S. operates, look at the whole scandal with, uh, with Biden and Trump and the impeachment of Trump for delaying weapons shipments to Ukraine and the Biden manipulation of a prosecution in Ukraine and, and so forth. Uh, I mean, the U.S. plays hardball with these nations uh, and we've got lots of money, we got lots of jobs, we got lots of business, we're going to send you weapons and the people to maintain the weapons and the troops to train your troops to use the weapons and some bases you can use too. And uh, I mean, they've got it down to an art and it, it's hard for nations to resist. Uh, I, I mean, Germany did its darndest, uh, but it could, but, but, you know, made itself look comical by trying to resist sending weapons to Ukraine. They were just going to send helmets or something and they got, you know, universally mocked. Uh, but it's because they don't want to start another war in Europe. They've been there. They've done it. You know, uh, they, they can't get the U.S. nukes out of their country. They can't get the U.S. troops out of their country. They could barely, uh, you know, turn down buying their own weaponized drones. You know, it's, it's hard to resist. Um, yeah, Diane. Yeah, this is Bill. Hi, Dave. Hey, Bill. Good to see you. Uh, good to I'm see you. Out. I see your beard, but good to see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, if, if the U.S. doesn't negotiate in good faith with Russia and stays firm on keeping NATO as it is, I see that Putin's in a bad place because if he withdraws without having settled anything over about the NATO issue, we will pound our chest like we did after the cold, winning the Cold War. And uh, I think we'll even press Russia even harder if he backs down. Do you think, do you think that would happen? I think you're right that everybody's in a bad place because they're all operating out of a militarist uh, ideology and machismo and the need to declare victory and save face and so forth. Uh, you know, you have Blinken telling the UN, if we predict a Russian invasion every day for the coming year and it never happens, we will be delighted. We will welcome the criticism. That'll be great news, you know. Uh, but he'll also be pounding his chest and saying, we prevented it. It was about to happen, you know. Uh, and, and yeah, Putin operates out of a similar mentality, we're going to stop this with our show of force. Uh, and if the show of force doesn't stop it, uh, then where is he? You know, um, and, and we need we need to be able to have people pull back from this madness. Uh, it would be great to have the United Nations. It would be great to have the European Union. It would be great to have some neutral players uh, or even legal bodies uh, be able to step in uh, and say, let's diffuse this. You're both right and you're both wrong. You know, uh, we don't have that. Um, you know, we, we don't have the, the international institutions that we should uh, that are that are able to do that. Um, and their biggest opponent for decades has been the U.S. government. Um, you know, this is a problem. Um, but I think, uh, but I think, if either side gets a war, both sides and all the rest of us are going to be way more miserable. You know, if, if 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 Putin gets a war in Ukraine uh, with countless troops and deaths, never mind the possibility of nuclear escalation, uh, Russian people are not going to be happy about that. Uh, even if they are happy for half a day, we know how this goes. They know how it goes. Both countries have done it in, in the same country in the case of Afghanistan, right? It doesn't go well. Um, so I, you know, and I think he knows that Putin is not, uh, you know, I, I hate to engage in reading Putin's mind, which is, you know, like the primary content in US media for the past few weeks. But 
uh, suffice it to say, he's not a complete idiot. You know, he, he, he knows that, that a war would not be fun. So I think, thank you so much. I, this has been very good. I think everybody's seen, had learned a lot and 